Imagine 10 years from now, you're living in a smart house, and you're not very happy because you didn't live in a smart house because you like to do that. No, some years before that, your government started to panic on climate change and forced lots of people to turn their houses into smart houses. What they didn't do was to make sure that there was enough talented, experienced, skilled people to, in to introduce the smartness in your house. So now when on Saturday you're cleaning your house, the system decides it wants to store a lot of heat in your soil and walls and it puts the heat on. Huh? You put the windows and doors open just to be able to continue working. In the evening the system thinks it has stored a lot of heat in your soil and walls and then you need a thick blanket to not freeze to death. And that's even the least thing, because it also has funny ideas about when you should be able to take a shower or not. And when it's really a cold day in winter, it really gets bad, huh, in a sense. Um, so I'm going to talk about a project which has been looking at storing energy at close to the customer. So not in Norwegian fjords with two dams, but uh, in your house. And we have like six demo sites where we have been implementing this kind of, of smart energy systems. And because the innovation there is on energy part, they've been using industrial automation standards, IT, to implement them. <coughs> and there are some lessons to be learned from that. Having the privilege has also looked at results from older projects. I could observe that there is maybe some progress but there was very little progress on capturing the expertise of the people who really solved the hard problems while building those demonstrators. So if we would take the results of the projects and just try to roll them out, you would need like skilled, highly talented personnel, and you won't find them in big numbers. And if you're lucky enough to find someone, you will have to compete with big industry when you have to pay them. So it's a, a problem that's staying on. Your government didn't take care of this issue, which the product also, also did not solve. So you're unhappy 10 years from now, and even you have been spending already a fortune on lawyers, because now it's the courts who are making up their minds who should solve all your problems in your poorly operating smart house. And they take ages to do it. So we have been developing, as the academic part in the consortium, uh, answers looking into what could solve it. So not the demonstrators didn't develop it, but I was responsible for in-depth interoperability, and I've been developing a solution where you capture actually domain knowledge into software, and because of that, you will be able to avoid these kind of problems in the future. But the project coordinator was an energy person, so me, I didn't know much about IT, and then you comes with something which looks like a very crazy, funny idea, to, which is not at all what industrial automation is doing. And uh, because of that, she didn't trust it completely. We have some severe project officers who are not immediately satisfied with what you deliver. So she asked the experts within the consortium to basically uh, check, eh, Paul, what he's doing, does it make sense? And then, of course, Toppy, which is the guy you would like to clone to be able to get a nice house there. Uh, the guy in industry, which really solves your problems, uh, confirmed her, basically telling her that we're looking at the parts which are returning over and over again. So this analysis that we need to, to grasp expertise into software was confirmed by Toppy. Now, Ingela here, because she listened to this talk, she learned about this talk, and because she is keen on... on airline solutions, and she definitely wants something that's safer than industrial automation can provide, uh, started to implement her smart house using the digital twins which we have been implementing in Erlang. And she didn't get installers which were more talented or more experienced than the other guys, but because each of the parts which have, were about to be installed in her part had a digital twin, when these persons tried to install a pump too closely to a flow meter, which would cause turbulence to make the flow meter not function well, the digital twins would flag this automatically because Ingela was clever enough to equip the installers with some smart gear, and as soon as they started to 
connect this uh, flow meter too closely to the pump, this would be flagged, and in less than an hour, the problem was solved. And this mistake was even made by the people who were, say, architecting her system. But luckily, Robert, her friend, is fancy computer games, so he made, with the help of Digital Twinch, which basically provided 99% of the code because they self-model, they had a digital mock-up of the installation, so when they made the mistake of putting the pump too close to the flow meter in the design, it was already flagged there. So he avoided these kind of things uh, completely. But Ingela had the same kind of hardware, and this hardware is not perfect, so also she got a problem with the temperature sensor that broke. Huh? When it broke in your poorly designed house with industrial automation, you basically needed to pay an expert to visit your house twice before you even detected and knew that it was the temperature sensor that was broke. Our digital twins are self-modeling and they're continuously, they do health monitoring of your system. So for more than two years, they were comparing the model data with the sensor measurement and they knew what would be the normal deviation between the measurement and the model. And so immediately you knew it was the temperature sensor which was the problem. Now, ex replacing this 20 euro sensor would cost a lot more than 20 euros because it was, it was behind 10 centimeters of concrete and 30 centimeters of ins insulation material. So if you want to replace it, your house will get very messy and if the repair of the insulation is not done perfectly, you might have a bigger problem than just a malfunctioning sensor. Because you had this model-based system, now you're able to just replace the sensing with the model. And you have more than a year of data to know how to take the model data as the sensor data. Your system becomes a bit less robust, it gets closer to the industrial one, but it still functions. And you can wait until five years later when there is enough stuff broken to go for the, the painful repair. Now, what are these digital twins? So here's Toppy again. So he not only told Mia that it made sense what I was been doing. He also gave me some feedback on uh, how I could, say, improve and had to reorder the chapters in my, my deliverable uh, following his advice. Um, on what I should say, stress, and how I could better communicate what I've been delivering. And the first thing he said was, of course, make sure people know that there is this concept of a blue-collar twin. So if you're a digital twin and you go to Wikipedia, you will see it's typically a back office device, eh? which say the people who have to manage a fleet of aircraft engines, use it to make better decisions out about the engines, but it's not there when the aircraft is flying around. Our digital twins are blue collar in the sense that they are part of the system itself. If you want to switch on a pump, you have to ask the digital twin of the pump to switch on the pump. If you want to read out a sensor, you ask the sensor to read out the, the digital twin of the sensor to read out the value. And if for some reason, in the middle of summer and you're on vacation, so you're not at home, uh, a control system wants to know uh, the temperature, and in order for the sensor to work, you need to switch on pumps and circulate until the, the, the fluid has passed the temperature sensor so you can get it, uh, the digital twins may say, hey, this is not necessary, and this is going to waste energy. So I have a smart system to save energy, and you're trying to be a smart controller is going to waste more energy than you're going to win. So then your model can just provide the information and you, don't, you save the energy. The other thing he said I would tell you about the different twin types. Now, some of you might have been reading the first line there, <laughs> quite heavy reading. So I have to warn you, this is where it gets out of your comfort zone. You'll all be talking about IT in terms of IT. What I've been developing is that you look at IT in, based on its relationship with reality. So we're going to look at software and not how, how it communicates and what protocols it follows. No, it's going, I'm going to look at software on how it, con what it means to the corresponding reality. And that's why I use the term digital twin, because it covers best to my knowledge of what I intend to, to develop. Now, I know it's out of your comfort zone, so there are some multimedia directives of uh, accounting for that. So there's no peach, mauve, or pink in my model. There is only basic colors and only three of them. So what's the, the key element is that the digital twins are in the blue part there. So you're in, 
In your blue part, you have what I call an intelligent being, not an intelligent agent. The whole agent community is about having objectives and having software achieving those objectives. This is just the opposite. I'm not involved in taking any decisions. This is a mindful agent in the sense it's only concerned about being. That's why I like the term digital twin, because it's all about what's there, about not adding anything that's there, but also not removing anything that's there. Uh, and your software components should be fitting in one of the four subcubes of the, uh, on the draw, drawing, because that obeys things you can derive from true assumptions. You should simply assume that there is no uh, infinite intelligence in your team, and that you have to build things, and that you can't know upfront what other things are going to come to you and you have to account for. It's like incremental development in software, very well known. And the second thing is that we're still not able to have generic intelligence. Any, any computer-based intelligence is, is quite narrow domain if it has to function. If those assumptions are true and you violate the architecture, there is always a price to pay. It's like to trying to make an irrigation system and some of your channels go up, upwards instead of downwards. That's the, the reason there. Now, what do you need to build as digital twins is that you have to make the distinction between instance and type. So if you're a digital twin of pipe number one, the instance knows that it's connected to pump number one and to temperature meter number one. And the type knows the geometry, the materials, uh, and the instance knows the type. The type doesn't know it, the instances. So based on the instances, if I give you one instance, you can discover the whole system. This instance also knows that it belongs to a certain, say, technical room. So the aggregate to which it knows, you can also detect. And it, basically, if you are allowed to get the information, so if you have the passwords or the, the user ID, then you can, just by knowing one instance, digital twin, you, and you can discover the whole system. If there is aggregation. For instance, the pipe type knows the material, but it's not an expert on the material. It just knows the digital twin of the material and you can navigate and ask the, the questions uh, for the door. So th the reason to have type and instance differently is a, is a matter of user mass. If you aggregate them, you decimate your user mass, and you increase the complexity of your software component, which is a very bad idea. Resource and activity, not separate, uh, separating them and not making them both first-class citizens has stronger repercussions. Because if you make digital twins of resources, and you also implement the activities which they're going to be involved in, you're only going to be able to use your resources for what their expected usage is. And vice versa, if you aggregate activities with the resources, you're never going to be able to use alternative resources to uh, execute the, the activity. What I wanted to tell you, basically, is that industrial automation, although it's capable of making very smart systems, so far doesn't succeed in capturing important knowledge, practical knowledge, the kind of problems which the, the, the engineers have to solve, huh? uh, into software. And because of that, if you want to roll out smart solutions in large numbers and on small installations which don't have a large capital investment to pay very expensive workers, uh, they don't have the solutions yet. And that with our digital twins, we're going to uh, get answers for that. So this is... <coughs> You need blue-color digital twins, so they need to become a kind of single source of truth for whatever is there in reality. And it's not only about physical assets, but also of things which are happening in reality. Um, and in this way, you get a kind of artificial intelligence which is embodied and embedded. So the pump there is the body of the digital twin. Uh, the fact that those twins are connected to the neighboring digital twins that they know that it creates embedded uh, artificial intelligence, which is completely different from what the artifi artificial intelligence community is, is targeting today. The reason why I just fell in love with the beam with Erlang and Elixir is that the semantic gap between what I'm mirroring in my twins and what I'm building in, in Erlang and Elixir is incredibly small. I think Joe also mentioned this. If you go to any other software technology, you will have a lot of work to do, which Erlang just does for you. So I'm not modeling anything from reality in data. I just have persistent 
Erlang processes, persistent Alexir processes, which implement my digital twins. And that's unbeatable, as far as I know, when it comes to implementing uh, this kind of, of solutions. Now, so far on, on, on the energy part, uh, my career is not started with manufacturing systems, has moved to network manufacturing, to logistics, to intelligent traffic, applying similar ideas to those things where basically comfort zones of decision makers in, in those domains are the main obstacles to, to be gained. In order to, say, really be able to get this into reality, I, a key element to be developed by the airline community, by the beam community, is actually to have these kind of digital twins for humans. Because they can then talk to all the other digital twins and reduce the overload in terms of, of attention drastically uh, in what you, you're going to do. Uh, it also gives you a natural point to put all the personal, sensitive, data-related uh, stuff on a service which is your own. Hmm? And you can give micro consents, and because you have these high availability Erlang servers, you be, you're, you're capable of, of uh, uh, say, none of the people who need your data have a good reason to keep it themselves. You give it to them, they do something with it, they give you an answer, they ask you maybe to deposit some processed information for a next service uh, request, but there's no reason at all for any service provider to keep the data for itself. You can just keep it to your own. If you look, is there a demand for a human digital twin? This is coming from the medical world. I can show you the, the manifest from which this, this picture comes. Uh, it's an impressive list of, of institutes which are looking for, uh, looking for digital twins for humans. You can imagine if I have a digital twin of your kidneys, and you have digital twin of the medication schemes you have, if they are going to poison you, the, t the twins will warn you uh, well on beforehand. And the final thing to tell is that we will be fighting in this kind of things to, to get the beam uh, providing services which others will never be able to do uh, against, say, entrenched technologies. And in order to get there, there are a number of things we, we should do. One is what I call a JavaScript maneuver, and Peer is doing a good job in, in that thing. So you're going to do something with Erlang, but you, he provides a PLC-based part of his solution, and you can uh, tell the manager, we're going to use PLCs a little bit. Uh, and then by the time it's done, uh, oh, we do some prototyping in, in the beam because it's fast and high level, and then later on when it works, we will do it uh, industrial-wise. Ericsson knows how this story ends. Uh, <coughs> and then an important part in there is the concept of a device driver. So you will not be able to avoid to connect to legacy. And what is important is that the part where you need to know and use legacy, you only use it to implement a device driver, which gives you access to the device functionality, but is completely application independent. So if you need to use this device somewhere else, you only need to know the beam. If your application changes, you only need to know the beam. That's the, the part that I want to do. So I've been sharing you some, a little bit of what we did in energy. I've been taking you out of your comfort zone by presenting a reality-centric IT architecture instead of an IT-centric IT architecture. Um, and what the, the, the main message is basically that there is a huge space of opportunities for the BIM community, but it's not only opportunities, I think it's even a responsibility. Because I don't, I hate to see, to get old and chronically ill in a society where I don't have my digital twin using all the possibilities of the, the BIM technology uh, compared to what I can expect if this does not, not happen. So there is a lot of activities in, in Erlang which are looking in, into big servers and whatever, uh, but I think that the things that really impact your life immediately, that reduce your information overload, that arrange things for you in a much better way, that's still to be explored, and it's not only an opportunity, I think it's even a responsibility for us to take care. So thank you. There's a possibility of doing PLC programming on, yeah. uh, on the beam. So I'm saying we'll be able to do uh, CNC control on uh, even using skaters to control. Well, I think CNC is 
so what you see is industrial automation yeah. had to provide uh, solutions when the technology was barely capable of doing it. Eh? Okay. The oldest one is CNC. Yeah. Eh? Because computers were very expensive then. This, they, built, they would fill this, this room and would be millions of dollars even at that time. Yeah. The architecture there is what you call a pianola, the, the, the architecture. So yeah. the computer generates a program which is punched into a paper tape and then you have an electro electromechanical thing which plays it off yeah. and makes a copy of it. This was done for uh, screws of submarines which had to avoid making noise. Huh? Yeah. And this, the, this community is locked in into this architecture, which okay. means that it's very unresponsive. So you, it puts start and then it doesn't listen to you until the thing is done. Even 3D printers work, work like this way. Yeah. So the, the way there is to uh, chunk it up in smaller programs so you can distribute and you trigger them from, from Erlang or, or PLC. Uh, so you have uh, more intervention possibilities. Uh, or you go to DNC, which is a direct uh, numerical control. So you, you send command line per command line to the machine and it executes them one by one. Okay. PLCs is a different story. They, they, they are, say, software versions of electromechanical circuits, huh? yeah. switching the back and forth. And they, they have real issues with representing state. Huh? Okay. So they, they're just doing things. And what you, you need to do is basically, uh, you have a table in which you have the IOs connected to the PLC. Yes. And your Erlang program writes the outputs in the table and the PLC puts them out. And the PLC puts the inputs into the table and the Erlang program reads them out. That's basically how you minimize the, the role of your PLC in the overall thing. Okay. If there is a, a really hard, hard real-time security issue, which is very local, you can program it in the PLC. That, that's how you divide the, the responsibility. I mean, we've, we've seen what uh, the Cynic um, modeling the whole UIs on embedded devices. So we were able to do things like ladder logic yeah. on the beam. Well, these, these things are quite simple compared to what we're doing. So to have uh, an implementation of ladder logic in the beam huh, yeah. is, is quite easy to program. Uh, if we ever, as soon as we get to the hard real-time beam components, we have full PLC logic just as as a small hex module uh, available, so that it's oh, more cool. it's more about getting to the IOs than than, than yeah, about yeah, the program. Yeah, and then yeah. interfacing to the hardware. Okay, no thanks, Paul. Thank yeah. you very much, Anne.